Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. We, uh, I'm Aldo Rol, and, and I'm Horias Lushansky. And we would like to welcome our special guest, Kieran, all the way from the wine region in Canada. And I'm pretty sure that he'll tell all tell uh, he'll, he'll tell us a little bit more about it uh, uh, in the in the uh, scope of today's session. So welcome, Kieran. Thank you. Now, um, why is Kieran a guest on the focus today? Well, when we uh, Horia and I and uh, our other partner Gareth uh, started uh, two or three years ago, we started helping Al Shalloway with building. Uh, the DAVSC course or the DAVSC certification for the PMI and Kieran was one of the the panelists that helped us uh, uh, that we participated with let me get that right that helped build that with us and that's where we met Kieran and um, it was really interesting to hear from his experiences as well as some of the um, the insights that he's generated or had from his career now, I'm not going to tell you about Kieran's career, but that's where I met. That's where we met Kieran. And um, we uh, would like to ask him to give a little bit of background about yourself and share a little bit of your life story, your, your river of life. How did you get here? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Aldo, and thanks, Gloria. Um, I've been in the delivery game, as it were, for uh, almost 30 years now. Um, like many folks that get into it, I started in a hands-on role. I, I have a comp sci background, uh, worked hands-on uh, as a systems manager, systems administrator for a few years, and then realized I like working with people a lot more than working with technology, and decided that I was going to do that shift to project management. Actually, I didn't decide. My, my former manager at the time uh, saw something in me that said, you know, this person might be good in a delivery leadership role and sent me on some project management courses that got me interested in that. Um, I have to have the opportunity to work in a project management capacity, um, both as a hands-on PM, as well as leading project management entities, PMOs, those types of things, and governance bodies over my career, both in an internal capacity as well as in a consulting capacity. And uh, sort of in my, in my most recent full-time engagement, uh, I was responsible for the standards and practices for the project uh, delivery practitioners within TD Bank, uh, one of Canada's big five banks. Um, so I had the opportunity to influence how roughly a thousand practitioners across the bank were delivering their projects, whether that was following a predictive approach or an adaptive approach. And that really gave me, I'd say, an eyeful in terms of the challenges with um, getting, getting our approaches to fit the context of what we find ourselves in, and also to be able to strike that, that fine balance between helping to address control objectives, which is one of the things that governance looks at, but also ensuring that we're delivering value in a proactive type of manner. About five years ago, I realized that my passion was around teaching. And so I decided to do a, do a sort of exit stage left, getting out of the corporate world, joined a small uh, partnership, uh, and I've been doing uh, delivery uh, training since then, uh, whether again, that's traditional project management, whether that's more agile related topics um, for both corporate clients, as well as public open enrollment uh, courses within Canada, predominantly within the Ontario province that way. Very good. Thank you for that, Kieran. And we may come back and touch on some of those uh, experiences that you've had, especially with the big banks, the big corporates, because we, we know that oversight um, is quite a big game in, in, in those <laughs> type size of organizations. So just for our listeners, um, Horia is just going to quickly uh, cover just again what we mean by adaptive oversight. And um, Horia. Right. Well, uh, we prefer the term oversight to governance for a range of reasons, but primarily because oversight is a bit sneaky as a word. It has two meanings. On the one hand, it gives us the impression of, of seeing from above uh, a bit of a distance. You know, you're detached, you're overseeing something. That's really, really helpful. But we also say, oh, we had an oversight. Whoops, we forgot something. We missed something. So from that perspective, the word oversight has this kind of dual nature to it, where on the one hand, you're noticing from a detached 
position, but you're also bringing to the surface things that may be missed otherwise. Because when you're engaged in the activity of something, you're um, focused on an activity in some way, you benefit tremendously from having some oversight, from having somebody a little bit detached to notice what's the bigger picture like. Are you still making progress in the right direction? Are you not missing anything? So that's why oversight is really, really helpful. Now, why adaptive is because our world is full of volatility and change and ambiguity. And as a result, we can no longer afford to oversee at set intervals with the same cast of characters. There needs to be more adaptation in how we approach oversight because things change relatively fast. Uh, we need to be able to pivot. We need to be able to draw in new and different perspectives into oversight. We need to adjust the way in which we go about conducting our oversight. So that's the intention with adaptive oversight. Thank you very much, uh, Horia. Now, Kieran, um, one of the things that you did not mention uh, when we asked you a little bit of background is that you're also an author. So we know that you uh, wrote a book called uh, Easy in Theory, Difficult in Practice, 100 Lessons in Project Leadership. So our first question is, is what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, absolutely. It's not so much a what as a who. Uh, I've been writing uh, and publishing my work since 2009, uh, blogging since 2009, usually on a weekly basis. And uh, after a couple of years of doing that, my father challenged me. Um, my father uh, was an engineer by, by education, by profession, and he got his doctorate. So he had got his PhD published, as it were. And so he challenged me. He said, well, this blogging thing, it's, it's yeah, that's dabbling. But if you want to make a mark on the world, you got to publish a book. And I kind of kept that advice or that challenge in the back of my mind, but I've always felt that a book is like uh, climbing a mountain. It's, 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 too big, it's too big an endeavor for some people. And I never felt I had the time to sit down and write a book end to end. Well, a couple of years ago, just as the pandemic was, uh, was sort of well underway uh, towards the end of uh, 2020, I recognized that after having been blogging for 11 years or so, I had over 800 articles. And I said, you know, what I could do to simplify this, this activity is I could do a best off. And so I, I took the 800 articles, curated them down to the what I felt were 100 of the most interesting from my perspective, but also looking at the stats in terms of readership and comments received and so on, and roughly organized them, did some general editing on them, and then published that, that draft. And uh, the whole process end to end probably took no more than two and a half months or so working with a publishing house. Um, the actual production of the draft was only a couple of days of effort, but I wanted to kind of put that check mark next to that, uh, that challenge for my dad to say, here you go, I've done it, dad. I have a book published. Uh, might not be the be all and end all, but at least I can say I accomplished that much. <laughs> Sounds like parenting never stops. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. So uh, it's quite interesting that, 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 you, that you found inspiration from your dad uh, about writing uh, the book um, and, uh, or getting inspiration there. So what was your intention with the book? Not just to yeah. meet the challenge from your father, but uh, what, what was your intention as uh, other intentions? Absolutely. So almost throughout my, my writing history, uh, the common thread between my articles has always been there's theory on one side and then there's the application of that theory on the other. And what we learn in a course, whether it's an adaptive uh, delivery course or a predictive one, rarely does the real world work in that manner. Um, and so I recognize that for practitioners, regardless of their level of experience, whether they were new to delivery leadership or whether they were seasoned, they were gonna encounter situations where they had to take what they had learned from a theory perspective and adapt it or throw the book away at times. And so I wanted to provide a field guide for different aspects of delivery leadership and 
how do things actually work out there in the real world? Mm -hmm. And that has always been sort of that common theme through my writing is I would see a situation, whether it was within the company I was working for, a client, something I read online, and that would trigger a thought. And I would write an article and I said, you know, this could be turned into a real field guide. So while I'm certainly happy to have somebody pick up a copy of my book and read it cover to cover, I think a more useful way to benefit from it is to skim over it, but then keep it on the shelf. And as people are encountering real life challenges in the project, or the products that they're delivering is to kind of thumb through it and say, hey, I know there's an article in here I'd seen that might relate to the situation I'm facing and review that. So I kind of think of it as a working field guide for delivery leaders. Sounds Thank fantastic. You. So out of these 100 or so items, what are your top three? Uh, it's, I mean, it, as you can imagine, it was very challenging to narrow 800 plus articles down to 100. To go from 100 to three is, is extremely difficult because, I, I mean, I, I can look at them and say, they're all great. Which ones do I, do I really like? But the three that I picked out when, when I was thinking about that question um, all relate to um, some thought provoking ideas. So the first one I'd like to share is the one that I titled, Don't Blame Corporate Culture for Not Cultivating Psychological Safety within your team. And what that relates to is we all understand the importance of psychological safety as delivery leaders, but many times we're working in a small as a small component of a much larger context. And if the prevailing culture within our organization or department is against psychological safety, it's very easy to sort of cop out and say, well, there's not much I can do about it. There's behaviors that are happening one or two or three pay levels above me that I can't really influence. And so that article focused on to say that, listen, yes, you may not be able to change the world overnight as far as creating safer environments go, but you can take a back seat and say, it's not my responsibility. I got to wait for the CEO or the C-level leadership to do something about it. So that was the first one. The second one is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, which is risk management. Whether we're delivering in a predictive manner or an adaptive manner, the difference between initiatives that succeed and fail is often how effective their risk management approach was. And, but many times we face st stakeholders on our projects that are not inclined to support risk management activities. They're, they're either in that uh, rose colored glasses paradigm where they're saying nothing's gonna go wrong, or they're looking at the constraints on a project and saying, we just don't have time, money, what have you to spend on risk management. And so when I've worked with stakeholders that are acting in that manner, or I've coached people that are facing that problem, what I always like to state is use the analogy of insurance, personal insurance, as a way to justify risk management costs. A project is an investment after all, it's an asset or it's expected to produce an asset. And in the same way as in our personal lives, we would never think of buying a car or buying a house without insuring it. Risk management is insurance for those investments. And when you use the power of storytelling or the power of analogy, sometimes that helps to overcome that natural resistance that stakeholders might have. And then the third one is another one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. It's about the whole topic of organizational learning. And if there's, if there's an oxymoron out there, it, it's lessons learned. I mean, the number of organizations I've worked with that institute lessons learned practices, but never actually learn lessons oh, is, yeah. is, I mean, <laughs> I can, nine out of 10 times probably. So I wrote an article called, Are Your Lessons Garbage or Gold? Where I shared some of the ideas I have about increasing the likelihood of learning from projects and learning from the work we do, whether that's, uh, capturing, curating lessons more frequently, whether that's about baking them into our standards and policies and templates rather than just capturing them in a document, whether that's about categorizing them and really distinguishing between genuine knowledge, reminders, and organization dysfunctions and treating each in a slightly different manner to get the best bang for the buck. So those are kind of maybe the three out of the hundred that I would pick. I have uh, two follow-up questions there. Uh... So when you talked about this effective risk management approaches, is it just a factor of cost or are there other things at play as well for ex the excuse for not to do it? 
Yeah, absolutely, Aldo. It's not just a question of cost. I mean, cost certainly does play into it when you start to look at the, the balance between how much do we invest in risk management relative to the return we get. Cost absolutely plays into that. More of the time, though, I find it comes down to either the risk tolerance or risk biases that our stakeholders have mm. may incline them to be more um, gamblers with certain types of risks. And the other factor I would say is it's a question of priority. Given infinite amount of time, very few senior leaders are gonna say, yeah, we would ignore risk management. But given they have so many balls that they're juggling to invest the effort, the political capital in actually being proactive about a risk response, that's something that might be taking them away from something else. And at the end of the day, a risk is not a certainty. And so they may look at it and say, should I invest my precious time in this activity that's tied to something which may or may not materialize, or should I rather throw my effort behind this other action that I know will translate into uh, a guaranteed ROI of some kind? I've noticed another thing uh, associated with what you just explained, um, and this is not just balancing where do I spend my time and the cost, but I've also noticed um, in my wanderings around that it's too hard for some people to deal with. So they would just stick their head in the sand and ignore it um, as well. That here in New Zealand, we talk about it's in the too hard basket. So um, I think that's probably another thing, uh, phenomenon around that as well. Absolutely. I think you're correct on that is that sometimes we do face risks with our delivery that appear to be too challenging to tackle. And that's where I think when people are looking at it with a very sort of a black and white view saying, well, it's either we do nothing or we have to entirely eliminate a risk. It can seem that way. The question, though, is can we start, start to think about other options? Is there an opportunity to transfer the risk? Is there an opportunity to maybe reduce the likelihood a small amount? Even that would help mm -hmm. reduce the impact. I think when we start to see that we have, have optionality, then it becomes less challenging. If you start to think about it as being, well, we want to eliminate a risk, absolutely, that might be too challenging for some people to tackle. There's also this, this idea of cognitive overload that, that could play a role as well. So it looks like Mount Everest, you know, it's all like, um, it, it's, too, it's too big. Um, and that's correct. Yeah. And that's why I, I think risk management is a great example of where the Pareto principle can be applied. Uh, on any given initiative, there's going to be hundreds of things that, that might go awry on it. We can't worry about all those. We need to focus on the vital few that are going to increase our odds of achieving our success outcomes as much as possible and recognize there's going to be a whole bunch of others that we just don't have time, money, capacity to address. One of the failings of project managers often is that they will overwhelm their stakeholders with too much information rather than focusing on what those vital few are and positioning in a way that the risk matters. Um, Dr. David Hilson out of the UK, uh, project risk management uh, thought leader, has a great definition for risk risks. A risk is uncertainty that matters. And I just love that line because it's the that matters part. If we don't do a good job of positioning a risk and the impacts to our stakeholders so it matters to them, we're not going to get the reactions and the actions that we're hoping for. Very good. Thank you, Kieran. Oria. Um, we see a tension um, between, let's say, the people working in a project and the oversight community, right? There, there seems to be a, a bit of a friction um, at, um, at various times. Um, as a matter of fact, very rarely do you find a, a, a beautiful, magnificently synchronized uh, oversight community. It's almost as if the oversight people uh, or, or some of them have this idea that uh, to show their value, they need to find fault with things right, and complain, and that doesn't work, and why isn't that, uh, and, and, and so and so, right? So I'm wondering, uh, in your travels, what um, uh, techniques, and in your, in your book, um, how do you help people to resolve this tension a little bit and, and make it more harmonious? What's your thinking? Yeah, so my book doesn't specifically get into uh, areas around oversight, um, 
explicitly in a single article, but it's a common thread through a number of the articles, which is that we need to focus on the outcomes we're looking for rather than the methods we use to achieve those outcomes. Mm. And I always would say that my easiest way to evaluate somebody in an oversight function to see, do they really get it, is are they focused on things like artifacts, existence of an artifact or a checklist versus a control objective that they're trying to achieve. If we can pull the people back, the oversight people back to say, what is the objective that you're trying to achieve? Then there might be 50 different ways to achieve that. And as long as they, we can demonstrate that the way that we've decided to do it as a team meets that control objective, they should be happy. So I think that's been part of the coaching that I've had to do in the past with people in oversight type functions, that you see the ones that are mature or able to evolve that move from the, the how into the what, really focusing on the plot that way. And that's kind of a common theme in my book is, is talking about that there's definitely many, many, many ways to achieve an outcome. Mm. Let's figure out what the best approach is in a given context. And that's something that I think, uh, while I had touched on it in many, many times over my career, the, my work with the bank really brought it to a forefront because a typical financial services organization has legion control partners. There's more control partners than you can shake a stick at. And absolutely, you will find certain control partners that you almost, it almost, the perception is almost they're trying to prevent delivery from happening <laughs> and <laughs> working with them and seeing them as partners and not as um, combatants or adversaries is, re can be really challenging. Mm. Um, but it's a very rewarding journey to be able to work with them to introduce leaner, more value focused approaches to oversight than the have you filled out this checklist and do you have these 40 documents to prove the, the, the worth of your project. That's a really interesting um, uh, comment and our research have found exactly the same, uh, Kieran that there's lots more value in understanding those control objectives than the actual means by which you address it. And I've seen many fights, literally fights, cat fights uh, about the means, and it's never about the end. So um, uh, <laughs> that's quite prevalent. Um, uh, that, I'm just having a, a thought here that maybe uh, that's a question of maturity. Um, whether you fight about the means or the ends. Um, it's, I think maturity certainly plays into it. I think it's also, it always tends to come back to uh, what are the metrics, what are the measures that drive behavior in certain groups. If control partners are being measured based on things like the number of findings that they have about a project, well, of course, they're going to come up with as many findings as possible. They're not going to focus on working hand in hand with the project team to ensure the success of the project. Um, so oftentimes it's that we don't have alignment in the measures across the delivery groups mm -hmm. and control groups in our organizations. Right. So uh, thinking now um, in the vein of appreciative inquiry, uh, would you care to tell us about some of your, your greatest moments in interactions with uh, oversight partners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it goes back, I'll, I'll look at my most recent experience at the bank. Um, just before I left the bank, uh, we introduced a shift in the oversight uh, standards for project delivery. Um, Prior to that introduction, the funding model for projects had been the typical big bang type funding. So there was expected to be a certain amount of money uh, requested up front to do a bit of exploration. And then once that exploration was done, uh, you were effectively requesting the bank to make a commitment for the entire uh, value of the project, which could span multiple years, multi-million dollars. Um, and of course, that tended to drive the usual evils of over planning and false accuracy and so on that we're used to. Um, with working within the Enterprise Project Management Office, my boss and I recognized that that needed to change. We were moving more in an adaptive direction. We said we needed to move to more of a progressive funding model. And so while we could certainly see the benefits of it and understand how it would be possible to put in checks and balances to make sure it wouldn't be abused, 
our control partners were naturally very concerned because they were very comfortable with this idea that when a project was coming to get their commitment on the overall spend, there was going to be these 60 documents filled out in great detail. There was going to be detailed bottom-up estimates available, all this great stuff that people could look at. Now, they were, of course, ignoring the fact that almost no project bigger than a bread box was actually meeting those, those plans. So they were happily, blissfully unaware of that or, or ignoring that. But the existence of the artifacts made them feel very, very comfortable. The existence of the various checkpoints made them very comfortable. So we had to work very, um, I would say, very collaboratively with them to try to get, one, their buy-in, but secondly, come up with a solution that they also felt they had contributed to in terms of bringing in this progressive funding model. And in parallel with that, we, I really pushed for leaning out of our standards around project delivery. So prior to that point, we had used a very artifact driven approach. So depending on the scale or complexity of a project, there was a simple profiling tool that would spit out, here's a list of X number of documents that you're required to produce over the life of the project. And it really didn't do a good job of um, tailoring to the needs of projects. So rather than that, I said, let's take a step back. Let's instead focus on understanding control objectives. So we went to each control partner and we said, well, from your perspective, what are the one, two, three things that you keep you up at night when you think about mm -hmm. projects? We got that list. We identified which control objectives would be tied to what stage in a project's existence. And then we just published that. And we said, here you go, very simple spreadsheet, list of control objectives. All you have to do as project teams is provide evidence or show that you're meeting those objectives. And so whereas in a traditional project, let's say, for example, traceability, they might choose to use a traceability matrix, a traditional mm -hmm. traceability matrix. Well, on an adaptive project, they could go into JIRA and produce some sort of a report that showed the linkages from themes to epics, down to user stories, down to individual defects. If they could produce that at any given point in time for the releases that have been completed, then that was goodness. That was traceability. That's what we wanted. So that way, we put the power back in the hands of the teams to be able to figure out how much, how little. And we also leaned out the oversight function that was looking at that. Prior to that point, we had an extremely onerous review process to make sure that projects were in compliance. We really leaned it out, focusing more on the exceptions rather than punishing the majority. So really rewarding kind of an activity to go through. Uh, heavy change management exercises you could appreciate. Given <laughs> that we had to change the mindsets and the behaviors of all of these control partners. But the really great thing was I had a chance to work with some really sharp leaders across all these different areas. And there was extremely strong executive support to make sure this happened. Um, we were able to get it pushed through as a result. That sounds like a really good formula. Have that air cover or the executive support um, co-create it with the, audit, with the people needed to do the auditing as well as figure it out uh, and understanding that there can be multiple ways in which to achieve the same outcome. So really, Absolutely. really good, uh, uh, good just summary there. Thank you. Um, now, you've, uh, you, you've explained from your experience one of, your, one of the greatest moments. Um, what other moments did you have <clears throat> uh, with Oversight? Oh, there have been, I, I would say, probably the frustrating ones have managed to <laughs> outweigh the positive <laughs> ones. And, and, and this even goes back to when I've been in oversight type roles. I mean, I've led a couple of project management offices, and they were in organizations that had characterized the PMO in very much an oversight, a command and control type role. And the struggles I faced was in starting to change that perception to stop being viewed as the bad guys by project delivery teams and start to be viewed as actually partners, folks that were there to support, to help improve the likelihood of success. And it really is an uphill battle that when, when the staff within a PMO get into this us and them kind of thing, oh, they didn't fill out this document, oh, they have, don't know what they're doing, it's really easy to get into that mindset of, yeah, we're, we're, no one wants to follow our rules. Well, we need to take a step back and say, wait a minute, if it wasn't for these project teams, well, change wouldn't happen. We wouldn't have a business to run here. So 
changing that behavior from both the, the, the folks that work within those functions, but then working hand in hand with the control partners to change that perception that you got to just go through this checklist. As long as you meet that, we're good to go. It can be extremely frustrating because for every conversation you have where you feel that you're taking a step forward, the, the light bulb has gone off in somebody's mind, you'll have three conversations with folks that clearly are showing they are stuck in the old way of doing things. And, and unfortunately, one of the groups I find, and it's not just in the bank, in other organizations I've worked with that had a similar function, uh, internal project audit tends to be a really challenging area because the nature of project audit is to be able to review projects and find variances. And so they really are incented to pick fault. And when you get people that are going strictly by the book, it, it really can be very painful. They will start to nitpick, they will, they will, they, so much of a team's effort can be wasted in finding evidence and justifying why something was done, where the focus of those teams should be on delivering value to the business. And, and I think that's where when you see sort of oversight gone wild, you, you've got potentially a very safe business in the short term, but you've got a business that's setting itself up to become a dinosaur in the longer term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were explaining that, the word bureaucracy came to mind quite strongly. Um, and uh, I've been quite outspoken about bureaucracy in the past, so I'll just leave it right there and let us move on. Um, uh, so you've had those frequent struggles uh, with uh, oversight situations, especially when those entrenched biases and um, uh, the fear of change uh, at play. Um, in terms of your greatest moments and some of your frequent struggles, uh, what keeps you curious about um, oversight? Yeah, I think one of the things I really uh, that always fascinates me about about the oversight function is how do you make it virtually transparent? It, to me, an oversight function should be invisible. It should be there keeping us safe, keeping mm. the work we're doing safe. It, there should be as little friction as possible. And trying to move to a frictionless oversight situation is, is sort of the holy grail for me. If we could achieve that, I think that would be a wonderful thing because you'd have projects that were being delivered in a safe manner from the perspective of the organization and the team. And yet there would be no friction reducing the value delivered from that. So finding ways to achieve that always uh, is, intrigues me. But that sounds like one of the things, and, and I'm just spitballing here, so just uh, go, with, go with it, is that in order to achieve that seamlessness that, uh, you know, um, that you've explained, maybe we need to think about making uh, the team members accountable for oversight oversight as well it's not just somebody sitting on the next department that will do that is is ultimately if we if we want to succeed as an organization everybody should become um to some degree responsible for overseeing or oversight absolutely and and that's where i think in the same way as when we're looking at the requirements on a project, we're going to have functional requirements, we're going to have non-functional requirements. The non-functionals are going to come from many, many different stakeholders. I kind of view that a, a good team will also gather and understand these control objectives. They don't need to have these outsiders coming in and mm -hmm. saying, oh, you need to do this, oh, you need to do that. They understand that in intuitively and you, we've got business leaders, product owners that understand that balance between what needs to be done to get the revenue, but also the fact that there is some effort the team may need to spend, they themselves determine on being able to keep the project, the organization safe. But I totally agree, Aldo, if we can get ourselves to the point where explicit oversight functions are not necessary and whether it's the knowledge from the team coupled with tools that can produce the necessary types of reports that maybe an external party might need just to understand that things are being done in an appropriate manner that's great we're, we're moving in the right direction then mm. now i'd like to to challenge a little bit um um, something that, that Aldo uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, um, bureaucracy, right? Um, now, if we look at the, at the word itself, 
right? It essentially um, roughly translated the elements that make the word up would mean the rule of the desk, <laughs> right? So um, the intention with the word is to say, there are rules to be followed. We must follow the rules because if we don't follow the rules, we're in trouble. Um, and in fairness, there's value in agreeing a set of rules and following that set of rules. However, as with everything in life, too little of something, it's not good. Too much of something is also not good. So um, rather than simply framing in our minds, bureaucracy, bad, uh, what else is better, right? And thinking in, in kind of division terms like this to say that's us and we're good and that's them, the bureaucrats, and they're bad. Um, I get the feeling that it's a lot more effective, but a lot harder to think in a more nuanced fashion, right? So we have, for instance, um, wonderful efforts from uh, Gary Hamill on humanocracy and um, the guys uh, behind corporate rebels and so on to show that, yes, there are numerous organizations around the world that are figuring out clever ways of going beyond the typical constraints of um, ossified bureaucracies, shall we say, and that are more, more humane, more dynamic, more inspired by better human connection. So with that, um, I would argue that we have a challenge of overseeing bureaucracy in a more effective manner in such a way that when we overstep and we focus too much on the rules, we figure out a way of, of kind of walking back from that and saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. But it's the value that really matters more. How do we adjust the rules? Do we uh, have the freedom and the, the humility to acknowledge that the rules may benefit from some tweaking in order to serve value, because we're not really just serving the rules, we're serving humans, and humans yeah. are different and, and change, right? So, um, yeah, that's, a, that, it's a, that's, a, that's a good insight. I mean, I, I, and I think for me, I mean, bureaucracy has a negative connotation. I think we're talking about structure. We want some structure, but not so much structure that becomes crippling. And, and I think when we take a values and a principles driven approach, and we educate our and incent the staff within our organization to want to align with those values and principles, then if we're hiring good people, they will tend to organize in a way that does the right kinds of things. Mm. Do we need a safety net? Yes, I think we need a safety net, but that safety net again should be as invisible as possible. It doesn't need to be explicit. It doesn't need to be in your face. Those are guardrails and the guardrails should be sort of far out enough that they allow flexibility in how we ensure alignment or ensure compliance without constraining the creativity of a team. Um, I think that would be, that to me would be a utopian situation. So um, thanks for the zine slap there, Horia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've read probably too much uh, uh, tales of uh, bureaucratic overreach, let's call it that. Um, and there's even a, a guy that wrote an article about the seven laws of bureaucracy. Um, and um, that, that was in, my, in the back of my mind when I mentioned that, is, is that uh, through that lens. So, um, but thanks for the reminder, Horia, that um, there is a different way to look at it um, and it does have value. We just need to uh, frame it in a different perspective. Um, thanks again, Dave, for the zine slap. So, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, although I don't know if you're referring to this chat, but I mean, I, this, this, this law sticks in my head, uh, Robert Conquest, third law of politics, that the simplest way to explain the behavior of any bureaucratic organization is to assume that it's controlled by a cabal of its enemies. <laughs> when you use that mindset, you kind wow. of understand why things work the way. <laughs> oh, God, we won't go into politics thing so we'll just leave it <laughs> at that okay um thank you for that um 
I uh, um, wanted to come back to something you said a little bit earlier when we asked you about the three mm -hmm. ideas, your favorite three ideas of the book. The third one you talked about, lessons learned not being used. Um, uh, people are going through the motions of doing the lessons learned, but it, it's just going through the motions because the tick box says we need to have a project post-mortem or a review of the project yeah bang we've got we've done it i can now get my bonus and and go have my fishing holiday so um how would you make it gold what what are the things that uh, you 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 found works quite well to turn that situation from a tick box mentality into we've actually invested the time and effort in thinking through how we can improve or how we can do things better how do you capitalize on that? Sure. So move, move, move from the one mindset to the other. So, so I think the first is to understand that you do need to invest in organizational learning. Organizational learning doesn't happen at no cost. And part of that investment can be people's time. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I saw is that whether we were taking an adaptive or a predictive approach, whether we were gathering those lessons on a bi-weekly, weekly basis, or we were doing it at the end of a phase or the end of a project, there never seemed to be the time to invest in actually curating that those lessons into any type of useful knowledge. There's actual effort required to take what might be a great idea for one project and massage it, scrub it, figure out what context was around it, and then share it broadly. Um, if you're going to bake it into templates, that takes effort. And so when you've got staff that are rushing from this work item to that work item or this project to that project, who is going to have that time to invest in it? So there needs to be that commitment of some amount of effort to say at the end of our project, the end of the sprint, the end of whatever, let's take these ideas that we have and we're going to curate them, get them ready to be shared on a broader level. Um, if we if we kind of scrimp on that, you're not going to get real value. Some of the other uh, thoughts that I have around the topic are you need to use multiple levers to share the learnings. It can't just be throw them into a, a repository of some kind. Yes, it's great if you have a centralized repository with great search capabilities. Fine, capture them there. But we also need to leverage uh, bodies such as communities of practice. Mm. Let the conversation between between practitioners share the learning. Uh, also bake them into your templates or your standards. So if there's something related to how a particular practice is followed, find the associated template or standard operating procedure, bake it right into it. If you do that, there's more likelihood it's going to get utilized than if you throw it in a repository and hope that somebody's actually going to do a search and locate it. Yeah. Um, other ideas that come to mind are, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, there are different categories of the learnings we have on projects. Sometimes they're reminders, things that everyone knows, but in the heat of battle, we just forgot. Well, if we're hitting these reminders, that could be a trigger to say, maybe we need to do some reinforcement training or some coaching around that. Sometimes we're hitting organization dysfunctions that we're calling out something that's going wrong, but it's not something that a project team can actually influence themselves. Well, maybe we need to gather those into some sort of a backlog, an organization dysfunction backlog, share that with the leadership team, and maybe the leadership team needs to commit every year to knocking off a few of those items. And then the final category is the genuine knowledge, project knowledge. Well, fine, that's the stuff now that we can share that individual teams can actually use on their own. One of the other things I really like is the idea of um, rather than turning our knowledge repositories into these garbage cans, why not put some sort of a voting system or some sort of a likes and dislikes? So when people actually make use of a lesson, have them like vote on it or have them say, yeah, I use this lesson and it was useful. That way, over time, we can start to see which learnings are delivering the greatest value and which ones no one's ever bothered to follow. And those ones we can purge so that we're not in a situation where we're facing thousands of lessons. Maybe it's just a few dozen or so. That's just some of the ideas that I would have. Kieran, that's really uh, great ideas. And now my follow-up question is, as I laid a beautiful trap for you, is what can the oversight function do in order to make sure that those things actually happen? 
<laughs> That's the, right. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think although you called it out that I think many times teams feel obliged to go through the motions because a lessons learned document or a post project review is one of the checklist items they have to tick off at the end of their project. So they rush through it. They complete it. It doesn't help anyone, including even the oversight bodies. Um, I, I mean, I think what oversight groups can do is to focus on what are the benefits. So I think if we see an oversight group as being an advisory or a supportive group rather than a gatekeeper, mm -hmm. they can start to say, hey, you're approaching the detailed planning stage of your project. Were you aware that we have this, we have this kind of information? Or if they're involved on a regular basis with the team, when maybe an issue emerges, they could be the voice to say, what have we learned from this, folks? What are we taking forward that we can, we can learn from that way? So if we start to see more of that um, kind of partnership model to say, what is the value we get out of investing in learning or investing in curating these learnings and then starting to search for the learnings, they can then help, I think, from that perspective. So what, what I'm hearing is, is that there is actually an added function or capability in the oversight community, and that's to move away from an auditing mindset to more of a coaching, mentoring, partnering um, uh, um, approach to, to things. Um, Absolutely. So Absolutely. Okay. And this is where, if you take a look at, if I draw the analogy to policing, um, there's the model of a police force as being a punitive body that they see a crime, they're going to go after that crime. And there'll always be a certain element of that needed. But where you tend to see a lot of successes with police forces is when they actually will partner with community organizers, they will work hand in hand mm -hmm. with people within the community and they're seen then as part of the community, not this other body that's always getting people into trouble. If you can get oversight groups acting in that manner where they're delivering value, not just kind of handing out yellow and red cards, people are more likely to be open. They're more mm -hmm. likely to want to work with those groups, I find. One other aspect that I want to touch on of what we just discussed is as well is in many cases, those improvement work or those lessons learned that need to be implemented work, call it improvement work for lack of a better word. Um, I notice that organizations don't view it as uh, work. They just see it as something else that needs to be done. And this is just another type of work. Learning is another type of work implementing an improvement is another type of work. So if you treat it as work, then I think you'll also be more likely to have it actually being, be, uh, have the benefits of it than viewing and treating it as a above and beyond my normal work that I need to do as well. Absolutely. And that's why, I mean, I, I really like the idea that whether we're using a backlog or we're using some other way to organize the work that the team has, explicitly calling out mm. the experiments, the improvement ideas that we're going to pursue, the knowledge acquisition, the learning that we're doing. If we call it out there, then we know we are making a conscious choice. Do we want to spend any effort on it or are we not going to spend any effort yes. on it? And that's a great kind of positive discussion you can have with product owners and leaders. If it's under the surface, if it's part of that hidden factory, it'll never get the, the respect it deserves. And that automatically builds in the governance as well uh, when it comes to Im improvement as well. Correct. Okay. Very good. Thank you. That was really interesting. Oria. Right. Um, here's an interesting minefield. Um, <laughs> frameworks. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about your experience of um, uh, frameworks and their potential interactions with oversight. Absolutely. So uh, I started out my career in project management, project delivery, being a fan of frameworks because uh, they give structure, they, they, they give you those recipes, they, they, they remove some of the guesswork around how we do things. But as I gained more and more experience and I started getting involved with a broader breadth of projects, I started to see the, the downside of frameworks. 
Um, and, and, and so that's the key is that frameworks like oversight it's, or like bureaucracy, it's not a question of it being absolutely good or absolutely bad. It's do they add some value? And if they're adding value, how do we go about ensuring that the pitfalls are not going to come and bite us? So um, frameworks can help and they can certainly make the work of oversight easier, but it's very easy with frameworks to get into that. Um, I'm going to turn my brain off and just do what the framework says. And oversight bodies will do the same thing. Yes. They'll say, we're going to turn off our thinking about what is the right thing to do and say, are they following what the framework said blindly? It's the typical ISO 9000 thinking. I have a process. I have evidence I'm following. The process might not be suitable. It may not be an effective process. Mm. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm following the process. That's the risk that, that oversight bodies face when uh, an organization adopts or a team adopts frameworks is they, 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 it makes their job on the surface a lot easier, but it takes that much more effort than on their side to say, yes, there's a framework that we expect teams will align with, but we understand teams should have the flexibility to stray from the framework when there is a good reason to do so. I think there's an inflection point in that reasoning um, related to the Peter Principle. Um, and what I mean by that is Peter Principle says that people get promoted to their level of incompetence, right? So in other words, you get really good at something, you get a promotion, you get really good at that, you get another promotion, and eventually uh, your level of competence has overreached and therefore, okay, you, you maybe get promoted laterally, shall we say, right? And um, this could be seen as a very disdainful view of, uh, of progression in, in hierarchies. But that's not the intention. The intention is one of noticing that um, when I'm feeling uh, a little bit like an imposter, when I'm feeling that um, I don't really have a lot of great competence uh, and I don't really understand the nature of the work sufficiently well to make competent uh, decisions about it, then I get much more easily tempted to retreat into ritual, into form rather than content and say, hey, I don't know, I don't get it. Um, I don't know really what would be valuable or meaningful here, but I have this process. I'm just going to follow the process. Yeah, that's so, a good insight. So uh, that, that's definitely a good insight, which is that it removes the need to think. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the danger is if you have a team that understands the why behind the decisions made in the design of the framework, that's one thing then they're, they'll have the savvy to know, um, based on what we're currently facing, it's safe to change this element of the framework. We're still addressing an underlying need, but we're gonna do it a different way. The problem is when people don't take the time to understand the why and how the pieces of a framework fit together, they're more likely to either blindly follow or if they don't like the way certain pieces fit, they will jettison them without understanding the consequences of that. It's again, the typical local optimization, global sub-optimization. And, and a framework like Scrum is a great example of that. Scrum, the pieces all fit together. Yes, there's absolutely large gaping holes in terms of the overall design, but within the box that is Scrum, there is a rationale behind every piece. And when a team chooses to just pull a certain piece out without understanding why it was there and making a really thoughtful decision around that, chances are they're going to do themselves harm. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really powerful thing. Now, um, we could also suggest that if you look uh, historically and see this organization using this framework has encountered this, this, and this challenge. And this organization using that same framework has encountered, oh, look, uh, very similar challenges. And this organization, uh, the story happens again and again and again. Then you might think, hold on, if this keeps happening and we have a known framework, then couldn't we do something structurally to that framework to anticipate and have some countermeasures for said failings? Yeah. And that's why I have um, colleagues in the industry that, that uh, I dearly uh, appreciate and love, but they hate with a passion certain frameworks mm -hmm. for the, the, 
damage and, and deterioration that they've seen said frameworks um, kind of literally running havoc in, in organizations. So um, I'm wondering uh, how might we as caring and, and careful professionals inspire people to take a more, um, shall we say, a, a wiser perspective on, on frameworks and rather than blindly um, implementing, shall we say, um, have, a, have, a, have a wiser uh, interaction with frameworks and, and derive more value and suffer less um, havoc. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, uh, ideas like having a risk checklist where, uh, depending on the framework that we're instituting, uh, it will provide you with a set of conditions to say, for example, is this particular condition in existence at the team level, organization, department level? Uh, if it is, here's the risks that you face by instituting this framework. And here's some possible countermeasures. If we did that, so if the framework authors were to include something like a risk checklist to say that here are the, the, the prerequisites for success, and in the absence of some of these conditions, here's what you might face, that's, I think that would be a step in the right direction. Now, it doesn't guarantee that the people that are adopting the frameworks that choose to use them will necessarily absorb that, they will read it. But I think it almost feels a little to me like um, negligence that the guides for the frameworks never seem to include those prerequisites explicitly spelled out along with the risks of not having those prerequisites in place. Th I mean, having uh, pithy statements such as uh, easy to understand, difficult to master, that, that's great. But I mean, hand that to an executive, they're going to say, well, what's difficult to master about it? Help me understand that. And if there was that clear list baked into those guides, I think that would go a long way. And I mean, I might be picking on Scrum, but I would say the same holds true for the Kanban guide and for many other such guides is that they need to explicitly call out what do we expect to be in place? If that's not in place, where, well, what's gonna break up for mm -hmm. What's likely to break? Yeah, that gets really tricky at scale also, right? <laughs> so if we oh, look absolutely, at the- <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And Horia, that's where I would say, I would love to see the framework saying, here is what we believe our framework sweet spot is. And here are the contexts you absolutely should not use our framework. <laughs> so that's one thing that they very rarely call out is do not use this framework in this possible context. But of usually course. it's about the money. Now, Aurea, <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to come back to what you and Kieran say, there's, there's two, two things that I'm noticing. The first one is conditioning of decision makers. There's two aspects to that conditioning uh, of the decision makers. The first aspect is, is that many of those decision makers grew up in an era where organizations outsourced a lot of the thinking to consultancy firms. And they were conditioned to think that way. Oh, we have a problem. Let's get a consultancy firm in. And in many cases, some of those firms come in and have no context of what it is that they're stepping into. They just bring a ready-made framework and plonk it in. That's the first one, the first part of conditioning. The other part of conditioning is, is the way that organizations are designed. And those behaviors or those decisions are being rewarded. Um, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing that I'm noticing as well is, is I've asked this in an organization a few years ago, is why did you choose this framework? And nobody could answer me. So clarity on why the framework was selected is also missing in many cases. And the answer is because the boss said so, or because the uh, uh, consulting firm said so. Um, what do you guys think about that? I, I think both points are very fair. Um, the, uh, the, the context around the, the, the rationale for why a framework was chosen or was picked, oftentimes it's because so-and-so so -so other company is doing it, 
or yes. a, a leader comes from one company where there was some moderate success using a framework and they see in their new organization, well, it worked here, it must work there. And they apply that logic to it. And there isn't enough psychological safety for team members to speak up and challenge to say, well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. we're different. That doesn't fit our needs. And they blindly go with it or they give it lip service and under the covers continue to do what they were always doing. Um, on the first point, I think that's absolutely correct is that too many larger organizations have been relying on external consulting services. And what makes a consulting organization, what makes their lives very easy is to say, well, we're just gonna align with a given framework and and that's our modus operandi, rather than say, uh, we're going to hire uh, experienced practitioners that have a full toolkit and experience using that toolkit to know which approach might work in what context. It's a whole lot harder to scale a consulting organization with that type of expertise. And they probably wouldn't make their profit numbers if they tried to do that, because those folks are few and in high demand. Mm. And, it just would be very difficult to scale up for the big consulting firms. Yeah. So to come back to Horia's question about how do we do this, I think having clarity on why you adopting framework X or Y or Z or um, a, a mixture of those needs to be uh, needs to be discussed and, and made clear. I wonder if we're not missing something else as well. Um, and that has to do with the following question that I encounter every so often. Uh, shall we use Agile or not? Um, it's safe for us not to use Agile, isn't it? Um, <laughs> when, when, when people um, say things like that, you notice that there's a fundamental um, fear that people have that they're, they're, they're doing their best to uh, to work through and, and, and overcome. This thing is, is scary, is unknown. It's like, ah, I'm not good at it and um, it's unsafe for me to learn because uh, I don't want to look bad. I want to look like, wow, this person really knows what they're doing and trying anything new and different is uh, strange. So um, where I'm going with this is uh, you were mentioning earlier, um, put a disclaimer, warning, do not use framework X in such and such a condition, right? Um, when do people read instructions on the can? <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> and that's what happened with Rob. That's what happened with the rational unicorn right? process. Exactly. So, so <laughs> where I'm going with this then is, uh, yes, it's all wonderful to, to, to put uh, conditions like that. But the most important thing I believe, and th that might kind of save our bacon collectively, is not so much um, what it says on the tin, but um, understanding that it's about dynamism. It's about pivoting and noticing and paying attention to where you're at. So it's not so much a matter of should we or shouldn't we. It's more a matter of let's experiment, let's learn, let's figure out what are the, the limits, what are the good things and um, embrace that discipline because the discipline of frameworks is what sets you free. If you're just nitpicking and, oh, I don't like that, I'm not going to use that. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, it's too hard. No, I don't want to. If you're not actually getting yourself into the discipline and kind of how do you get good? You practice the discipline and in the beginning, you don't really understand. That's kind of why Alistair kind of noticed, oh, uh, in the martial arts, we have this shuhari thing. And that's kind of what we need here, right? In the beginning, you don't show up at the dojo and say, hey, sensei, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. Uh, you do your thing. I'll do, I'll do my thing. You, you know, it never occurs to you to say that. Yeah. Right. But in the workplace these days, you have, no, we don't like uh, any agile training. No, thanks. Uh, go away. It's like, we're, we're fine with how we're doing. It's like, hold on a second. No, no, you don't get it. <laughs> you don't understand. You have a, a, a mistaken idea of what that is, right? So we've somehow lost, and this is where oversight could come in and say, no, 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 no. To begin with, let's have that discipline. Let's understand the basics mm -hmm. first. And then let's learn to kind of detach from that a little bit. You know, the, the, the ha, kind of learn the limits of, and then finally the re of the detachment of the, the mastery, right? And, but that requires the discipline, the effort, the, um, shall we say, the encouragement and, and the, 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 more, the more masculine attributes of challenging and, and bringing people back to no, 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 that's not good enough like that. Do better. I believe in you. You can do better. Let's apply ourselves. Let's actually 
invest some sweat and toil into this and, and really learn it. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's a good, it, it, I, I think you're spot on. And I think that it's, it's kind of becomes the, uh, it's a meta layer of agility that, that again, it comes back to the leadership having an agile mindset mm -hmm. about how they approach the transition for their teams. Because a lot of what you spoke about, Horia, is about that agile mindset, that willingness to try something that looks scary, that willingness to experiment, try something out, recognize there's pieces that work that won't work there needs to be that willingness and that management support, which will then free the staff to try this out. And, and the difficulty that I've seen is that many times an organization's first few steps with uh, adaptive delivery happens when they're facing very challenging projects. It's a project that's already under the gun from some one or more constraints, and now they're having to change their way of working with it. And, and that just is setting them up for a really bad situation. Uh, you want to have a situation where there is flexibility, where there is that ability to have small failures and learn from those. And so you shouldn't have the bet the bank project as being the first one that you try to take an agile approach with, I think. I think you also need to deal with uh, personal biases as well as organizational biases. Um, you, you need to address those in order to overcome that. Um, it, it's quite interesting to observe how conditioned uh, decision makers and people are in many respects that when you want to do something like that those biases just slam in um, so you you got to find ways to to work around those biases or to work with those biases <laughs> the the question of bias is <laughs> is uh, is a very thorny one um, as well now in terms of of technique of habit i find in my experience that it's a lot more powerful when we change our language from you or they into us and we. So rather than saying um, you need to change this and you need to change that or they need to do this or they need to do that to have an inclusive language of I wonder if we can do this and we can think that and we can change this because that all of a sudden makes it that I'm also a lowly human along with the rest of us here. It's not just I'm the clever one that tells you how things should be done kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is just a, a, a neat little uh, polish, I think, that, that can help um, the, the, the pill to go down more smoothly. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's to me, that's change management 101 mm -hmm. that... Uh, if you make people, if, if people feel they are part of the change, they are more yes. likely to accept it yes. than if you're forcing it down their throats. Uh, I like um, Margaret Whiteley's um, observation that people don't resist uh, change, they resist being changed. Mm. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah. if you include me in the change, it's my change. But if you force it on me, it's like, no, I don't want it. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think it's I think it's two parts. One is certainly the the involvement in the implementation of the change, the design of the change. But I think there's also needs to be that understanding of the why. Uh, mm. They need to buy into the purpose of the change. Uh, if they don't understand what the end state is and why yeah. the end state is important, not just to the organization but to themselves personally, then even if even if they're involved, you're still not going to have their their hearts and minds. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good insight there. And that brings us to uh, another question we wanted to cover with you, because uh, you're essentially saying, understand the value mm -hmm. that this uh, course of action is intended for, right? So uh, what's your thinking about um, better ways of measuring the value of work and projects and the outcomes of our initiatives? Yeah, I think there's a maybe a couple of points I'd make on that. The first one is, uh, before a project gets started, before we decide to invest in a piece of work, we need to take the time to understand what success looks like and ensure there's some sort of a um, objective, measurable 
instantiation of that. Here's why we're doing the project. Here's how we're going to know whether or not we achieve that. And that's something to me that's table stakes. Don't start off a project if you can't get that articulated and agreed to by all your key stakeholders. Capture it in a charter, a vision board, wherever you want to put it, but that needs to be stated. And then I think it's important that benefits management is a work stream throughout your project, that there's somebody responsible over the life of the project for keeping an eye on expected benefits. And if it looks like there's going to be erosion of those benefits, then that individual has to be the conscience to speak up and say, wait a minute, I'm noticing erosion here. Yeah, we're delivering on time on budget, delivering the scope as expected, but the, the, the benefit model has changed. Something's changed in the environment. This isn't as beneficial project as we thought, maybe we would better spend our money somewhere else. Um, and there needs to be that understanding of when that project or that release is comes to an end, who's going to keep an eye on those benefits then? Who owns that? And what kind of expectations are there around the communication of those benefits? Um, what's the time horizon for it? Is it uh, a year after the end of that initiative or the launch? Is it two years? Is it three years? Whatever. That needs to be articulated up front, and then we need to be able to see that. And maybe the final thing I'd say on there is that the people that are championing the projects, the sponsors or anybody else that says, I've got this great idea, let's take it forward. We need to hold them accountable to those benefits. So I've worked in too many organizations where executives kicked off a project with some great pie in the sky projections and the projects were dogs millions of dollars spent, never saw any benefits, and there was zero accountability. They never got their wrist slapped for that. To me, that's just corporate negligence. There needs to be some sort of a reckoning that if, if you put a project forward and it, was, it did not realize the benefits and you didn't proactively address that, then the next time you come to us asking for project funding, uh, it's going to be a very difficult conversation. It should be a very difficult conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about that, because that, on the other hand, will say, don't take any risk. Al always bet on the sure thing. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me clarify. Yeah. I'm not referring to uh, the natural ebb and flow of experimenting. So if, if, a, if a sponsor uh -huh. is supporting, if a sponsor is supporting a lean startup type approach, here's an idea, let's, let's, create an MVP, see if there is viability in the marketplace for it. And then based on the data from that launch, we decide how, what we're going to do. I'm totally for that, an incremental approach to invest. But if you've got somebody that sort of bet the bank in a big way on this project and it turns out to be a white elephant, that's what I have a real issue with, where there's okay. no feedback loops until it's too late to be able to recoup any of that investment. Okay. That sounds yeah. like a failure of oversight as well. <laughs> yeah, very much so, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. But the problem with, the, with that is if you don't have oversight working hand in hand with the delivery teams, if they're purely looking at it from the outside, it's too easy to have green shifting and watermelon status reporting, hiding those types of things, right? Uh, because they will never have that same degree of knowledge about what's really happening on the project to be able to call, we've got a troubled project here. Mm. So what uh, haven't we asked uh, that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> oh, there's, there's a loaded question. <laughs> wow. Um, psychological safety is something I, I didn't really spend a lot of time talking or touching on. Uh, I look at the skills that project managers need to build or need to demonstrate, and I think one of the ways that a project manager or a project leader can differentiate themselves is around their track record on building safety, especially in contexts that are inherently unsafe. Uh, organizations that seem to operate with a hero culture or a toxic culture, being able to demonstrate that they were able to create sort of a zone of safety for their team and demonstrate uh, some amazing high performance results. That is, I think, a skill set that is absolutely going to be in demand um, over the next few decades. It's, it's going to be needed because as the, the VUCA nature of projects just gets hard, get more and more and more, you got to have psychological safety to get great results. Mm -hmm. 
it features quite heavily in all the research that we've done. Um, all of those psychological safety practices um, that that governance or oversight capability and functions needs to uh, fulfill. So it, that, what that we have, strong. however, is also a notice that uh, if we make it safe through force, in other words, no, you're not allowed to say that because it's unsafe, or um, no, you're not going to do that because it's unsafe. Mm. Um, that is uh, potentially damaging as well. So absolutely, yeah. It's it's not a question of putting so many layers of bubble wrap around teams that they can't produce results. Uh, in fact, it's the reverse. It's giving them the freedom to try things out. Um, making sure they're aware of where the guardrails are, but giving them that freedom to experiment. And yeah. uh, it really does go hand in hand with the idea of radical candor is that, that you need that ability that people are not afraid to challenge the status quo, to challenge one another when they see that something can be improved. Um, and you can't do that if you're facing a, we need to be nice to everyone, this needs to be a politically correct mm -hmm. environment. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. psychological safety is not about just creating a nice environment mm. forever. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Um, uh, the the niceness uh, is an emergent property of what the outcome is. Because if we're nice, but we're failing, that's not nice. That's the sort of ruinous empathy kind of thing, because we, we were too nice and we didn't actually challenge with the intention of mutual benefit. Because that's one of the things that needs needs refreshing. So where we're saying in our research that um, safety needs to be balanced with, it has to be balanced with courage. In other words, it has to be possible for some of us to be disagreeable and say, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And here's why. And I'm concerned because if I don't speak up, it's going to hurt us all. Because if I keep quiet, I notice this and we're going to hit that bump and nobody's going to like that we hit the bump. So I got to say something. Mm. You're not going to like it. And it's going to be potentially a bit painful, but hear me out. Yeah. So that takes courage because uh, some people are going to, oh, we need to do that. Oh, oh <laughs> I don't like that. It's going to be more work. It's like, oh. Too hard, yeah. but it's good. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, and then that's where, I mean, it, it does tend to go hand in hand with, uh, the longevity of the working relationships. So when we have long-lived teams, there tends to be that understanding that a person and their behaviors, the intent behind those is good, which means that we can then tend to overlook or forgive if the method in which they shared a particular message could have been maybe nicer. Um, it's when we don't have that longevity, when we're feeling ourselves out and we, we're not quite sure where the other person's coming from, that's where we're likely to take something personal when in fact it was focusing on an approach, an issue, not on the individual. So yeah. sometimes you get sort of those situations where uh, sort of a, uh, a personal attack is the perception when that was certainly not the intent. And those occur a lot more in short-lived teams than in long-lived ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, is taken and not given. Yeah, one of the things that we, we notice as a countermeasure to that, I mean, you look at the, uh, the work of Heidi Helfland on um, um, dynamic reteaming, right? We have teams that kind of change all the time. So in rapidly changing team contexts, um, we better get good at giving some of the benefits of longer lived teams. So in longer lived teams, you get people that develop that through experience over time. So as a countermeasure, uh, we actually promote very much the idea of team chartering. So through team chartering, you deliberately express and call out the values and the principles of engagement with the team. You share a market, the skills, a river of life. So you build uh, very much um, a foundation of trust as early as you can make it. So within a week or two, you get a lot of benefits that otherwise it would have taken months to uncover some of those deepest, uh, deeper elements of trust. So fortunately, even in shorter lived teams, you can get some of those benefits, again, provided you engage in the right discipline. Yeah. Correct. And, and I think if I draw a parallel to uh, uh, Adam Grant's givers and takers, I think you can have uh, rules of engagement, working agreements that sort of establish that, 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 that here's how we're going to interact. There is always the potential, though, you will get a player on the team that 
could use that or could abuse those. And we want to go into the situation trusting and being sort of the givers, but we don't want to be selfless givers either, because then we might be setting ourselves for trouble if there is a wolf among the sheep. Um, yeah. That's what we need to watch out for. So the working agreements could be abused potentially for someone that decides to be a bull in a china shop. That's where kind of having the, uh, the ability to say, okay, I've been bitten a couple of times. Now we need to work as a team to see how do we learn from that? How can we make things better? There must be mutual benefit. There must be win-win. Yeah. Right. And that is a beautiful uh, place to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much, Kiran. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran, and uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, your time uh, for from today. Um, I'm Aldo Roll. This is the focus, and I'm Horia. And we thank again, Kieran. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.